the Vantex podcast. I have Michel Azurzri with me today. Um, he's a wildlife photographer. He's going to tell us more about it. He's based in Beirut at the moment, and we can't wait to chat to him. So, Michel, thank you so much for being with us today. I'd love to hear about your stories. You've been all over the world. I mean, if you go to your Instagram, it's just, it's phenomenal. I can just stare at it all day. So um, can you just tell us why you got into this career and how it happened? Well, first, I haven't been all over the world. I would love to go all over the world. And I mean, this is something I'm going to try to make happen before I'm too old for this. Uh, but yes, I have been traveling. How did it start? Basically, uh, I fell in love with photography uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, and it happened by coincidence that like most great things usually do. Basically, I was going to London, going to a polo tournament organized by a friend of mine. Uh, the plane was late. I bought a camera at the airport. I was, uh, this was about 15 years ago. I bought the camera at the airport and I took photos at the tournament. The photos were terrible, but I thought they were good at the time. And I fell in love with the camera. Uh, so this was the beginning of my love story with the camera. And as I was telling you, I'm not a full-time photographer. I have a career, a business career, and we'll go, you know, we can talk about this later, and a photography career at the same time. So basically, it's two parallel uh, careers. Why wildlife? Because I've always loved nature. Unfortunately, I'm very impatient. So the only way for me to spend time in nature was to have something to do. And the camera brought in the missing element, where I can actually spend days and days and days but now I have an objective, a goal, which is to get the photo that no one got before me. So this is, I was able to bring the competitive, you know, aspect into nature, which now allows me to spend a month, you know, basically doing nothing, but, you know, being in nature. Which I, th I, I think what's very interesting is um, being Lebanese, I think you are, um, I, full Lebanese, are you? Yes. Yes, yeah, yes. being Lebanese, uh, we it tends to actually run in the nation that there is this lack of patience. Things need to sort of happen now. So I think you're a great inspiration that you managed to find this balance and this Zen aspect and find yourself when you're actually in the middle of nature and really trying to do it. Sounds like Zen. I need to correct you here because when I'm trying to get a photo, and as many of my friends who came with me on these trips can witness, I'm unbearable. <laughs> I think it would be, uh, it's so, it's so interesting to hear because um, my partner as well, he's a professional photographer and he completely lacks patience, but uh, when he, when he is with his camera, he can just spend hours and hours and hours on one subject. So it's phenomenal um, how you guys manage to hone that in. <laughs> the thing is in wildlife photography, you can actually spend two, three weeks in the most, you know, difficult, challenging destinations and get nothing, which happened to me twice. Himalayas that we were about like for 5,700 meters, 5,500 meters for two weeks. It was freezing, it was cold, it was everything, and we were looking for snow leopards and um, didn't find any for two weeks. So I came back from the strip without any photo. And you were just like, oh. <laughs> no, it's, it's part of the wildlife photography, you know, trip experience. So you can't, uh, you cannot uh, really, you know, expect to go and get the photo you want every time. It would be too easy otherwise. I'd like to hear what uh, you do um, uh, as well. You know, you said you were uh, into business, you were a businessman. So if you could just tell us a little bit about that and how you managed to juggle these both, both, both these things. Um, listen, let's go back. Basically, my, my education, my background is business. I have an MBA from the States, from the University of Chicago, so I'm that purely business business. I don't have any photo, any formal photography education. I did self-teach myself later. I, you know, I really went through formal training you know, later on in life, you know, when I started photography. But I, I run a manage, I, I manage a medical device, a medical equipment company in Lebanon. It's part of our family business. And yes, I managed to find time to travel three, four months a year or two, three months a year, hopefully more for now. And, you know, I do my photography. And today with, you know, the ease of communication from pretty much everywhere, even from the most remote locations on, on the planet, um, you know, I managed to, uh, you know, be able to, you know, manage my business. Anyway, you know, a business has to be able to run without, you know, people. It should be basically, if someone leaves the business, the business is supposed to stop. In the Himalayas, for example, there was one spot on the mountain where there was reception. 
So every day, it's, yeah, exactly, <laughs> pretty much that's what I've been, that was doing every day. So every day, I was around, uh, you know, evening when there was no light anymore, we just go to the spot, I would get all my emails and all my emails, it was freezing, it was probably minus 25. Yeah, and I would get all the work done. So yeah, it was actually quite challenging, but fun. I enjoyed this duality. Um, so yeah, that's how I'm, I'm able to you know, manage the business. And I have great people here also, when, when I'm not here, they're doing a great job as well. So yeah, you can manage both. Now, now your, your business is based out of Lebanon, right? It's, uh, yes. So yes. How, how have you been finding that with everything that's happening in the country? I can imagine. So, uh, I mean, it would be really nice to hear because uh, there are a lot of people that I've been speaking to and a lot of them are artists. A lot of them are, um, are creatives. We do have people in politics as well. And every single one across the board has suffered, you know, whether they come from a marginalized community or an elite community. So I think it would just be interesting to see, you know, your perspective, how you've managed to handle this. I mean, it's been three years of absolute chaos and it doesn't look like like it's gonna you know there's light at the end of the tunnel currently so how's that making you feel you know I, to be quite honest uh, I, uh two feelings the first i'm you know i feel that i'm lucky that i'm able to actually have the second life which is photography and allows me to really uh, get away and have a purpose because you know you can't have a purpose today managing a business in lebanon knowing that the size of the business is 90 percent smaller than it was 10 Three years ago and the second is a deep sense of anger and frustration because lebanon is a perfect example of uh, the incompetent few managing the competent many so you know without going into politics because i really don't want this you know conversation to go through here i think lebanon is managed by a bunch of you know incompetent uh, dishonest thieves that have killed the dreams of a brilliant population this is, in a nutshell, my opinion on, on Lebanon. And I'm lucky, and you know, go, to go back to the lucky part, I'm lucky because I have photography that allows me to have a purpose. So basically, yeah, this is my, my opinion on Lebanon in two, in two words. I think it would I'm, just... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think it would be also interesting to hear, you know, because you have this creative background and you do have uh, photography, um, how, do you, how do you expect the creatives <clears throat> that are currently in Lebanon, you know, they're really struggling um, and listening to you, you know, it could be quite, um, maybe you can inspire them to try to find new avenues or try to, you know, find ways around these challenges. Uh, there's a couple that I've spoken to, they're being taken advantage of, you know, there's people coming in from places like Dubai and Saudi and other GCC countries, knowing the situation in the country, but knowing that they have access to super talented creatives and offering them this fresh dollars, as we put it, um, which is probably like half or less than half of whatever salary that they would take on a normal day. So there's this real frustration in the creative market right now. They're feeling abused. They're feeling useless, as you said, you know, lacking purpose. I think it would be really nice for them to hear from you. Um, and hopefully maybe, you know, what, what do you feel that they can try to do to help, you know, ride this wave? Okay, uh, let, let's you know answer a few a few points that you made. First, I don't really think that people from the Gulf are really taking advantage of us. We took advantage of them for a very long time when they used to come to Lebanon and overcharge them and everything. So they're not guilty. The guilty bunch are our very dear Lebanese-born, bred leaders that we have here. Um, I wouldn't look at, at Saudis and, and and Emiratis as being you know on the contrary, it should be an opportunity. This should allow these creatives, and, and Lebanon has a lot of talents, and, and sometimes countries in the Gulf lack those talents. This should be an opportunity for them to really go and try to not only sell one or two pieces, but you know, expand their horizons to these markets, get known into these markets. Um, I'm gonna be very blunt here. Before the crisis, many photographers, many artists were selling at very high prices. That it was not justified by the international market, they were justified by the fact that Lebanon had money and uh, the, the friends of the family, the cousins of the family, everyone around them, the family would just buy their pieces um, at high prices. Now, the super talented ones, I think today should take an opportunity of the fact they are super talented and amazing. That is amazing in artists in Lebanon to try to, you know, export themselves, whether it's in the Gulf, Europe. I know it's easier said than done, but 
if someone comes and buys something from you at a thousand and you think it should be three thousand, sell it at a thousand and use this opportunity to actually develop more context in this market. Get well known and then your price will start going up, going up again. Again, I'm not an expert in this because I had my business, as I said, to allow me to finance my, my, uh, my photography. So it would be really hypocrite on my part to actually give lessons to anyone because I don't have to go through this. Um, but I think this should be an opportunity that would force the, the artist to actually look abroad. And, I think, and I take, think uh, there is money in the area. Yeah, I think we go back to this topic of, you know, the brain drain then that takes place in Lebanon itself. Like Lebanon has suffered from that if for over the years, you know, huge brain drain to the country. Um, and artists that are necessarily inspired by Lebanon having to leave Lebanon. Yeah. So it's like it's like being removed, removed from your muse, shall we say, you know, um, and, and you're then put in a country where you're struggling. Yeah, but this happened in all fields. I mean, you know, I know, I know, I know a bit. You know, I know both fields: photography and the medical business. We've lost some of our best doctors. They're all in the U.S. and Dubai and Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Europe. I mean, they're leaving. You tell them why you're leaving, and they basically all have the same answers. You know, we have yes, we're being paid. We used to make uh, I don't know hundred thousand dollars a month in Lebanon. We're making. 25% of this in Saudi Arabia or Dubai or even the US, but at least we have a life. So this is very unfortunate, but, but it's, it's, I mean, again, it's the same thing. You know, if an artist is, you know, used to pay, get paid 4,000 and now he's getting 1,000 in Saudi Arabia, it's like a doctor. This doctor used to, be, to make a million dollars a year in, in Lebanon, now he's making 250. You can't blame the Saudis and the Qatari and the, and the Emirati for this on the country. You can thank them for opportunities and, you know, and blame our enlightened leaders here. Well, it looks like these elections might be coming up. I know we're not going to discuss politics, but yeah, I'm let's go just, to no, no, I don't <laughs> want to discuss politics. I just want to, to get your perspective on, on how you think this could turn around, you know, for the people that can't necessarily get out. Um, I'm assuming you maybe have the opportunity if, you know, all hell breaks loose in the country to not, get on a plane and leaving. You're I'm, not leaving. Well, that's good to hear because there's not many that I talk to that say the same no. thing. So. Yeah, again, you know, yeah, I'm not going to leave, no. It's, uh, I think we have an amazing country and we need to work together back. Yeah. Well, this was my question to you, you know, you, you still have people here, you still have people fighting, you know, you're one of them, shall we say, I don't want to say fighting as in the sense of you're on the ground battling against, you know, yeah. the thieves, I'm saying fighting for a chance to try and keep this country functioning, keep it rolling, you know, keep it turning over until it can sort of stand on its feet. I mean, we're being declared now internationally as a completely failed state. Um, as a businessman, I mean, surely that news falls upon you and, and it's quite devastating to, to hear. I mean, what, well, does I know that, what does that mean for you? Well, I know we're a failed state. I, mean, I don't need international media to tell me this. What it means for me is that we need to keep on fighting. And, you know, if things improve in the future, they do. Otherwise, we need to keep ourselves a fighting chance and Lebanon a fighting chance. So, uh, yeah, things do are very... Do you have hope? Honestly? Not much, but uh, let's see what happens at the next elections. If, if nothing happens during these elections, hope is dead. If we can have a real change during these elections, and I'm not, listen, I'm not blaming anyone, or I'm not saying you know, anyone is, should come or go or leave, but we need a change. You know, if you are in a company and your, your, your board of directors and your management has failed for the past 25 years, you, know, you change it after a year, not 25 years. So the same should apply to a country. These people have failed. You know, I'm not going to accuse anyone in particular. They failed. So if we can change them, we have a chance. If you don't, you can't. You know, do the same thing again and again. Expect different results. No, but it is sort of like trying to dig out a disease that they won't necessarily leave, and you're like fighting it and fighting it. So I mean, there yeah, are I'm a lot of people in the country that are losing hope, and they're just feeling like this is khalas, this is it, this is this is what we have to get used to. I re I, yeah. I rescind. I raise my hands. I surrender. Um, خلاص, you know? but it's, so, it's, it's the purpose of the private sector. And, and again, you know, this is, uh, let's go back to photography after this. But it's the purpose of the private sector to provide hope where the government hasn't provided any. So as private sector, we're struggling every day. It's a daily battle. I mean, you know, we're, we're, 
the size of our companies is substantially smaller than it was three years ago, but we keep on fighting to try to keep those people in Lebanon. Basically, the private sector today is, in my opinion, the last beacon of hope. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of dishonesty and people that are not uh, you know, decent, but the majority of people are. They're just genuinely fighting to keep their companies open and to keep their employees employed. Yeah. So this is how what we can do as a private sector, to keep on fighting, to keep on working, so we can provide hope for as many people as possible. And I know this might be a question that you might want to refuse to answer, but it's completely no. fine. <laughs> but, you know, you do carry uh, quite a heavy social media following. Um, you do tend to have an influence. I know it probably started from your beautiful pictures, but like, is there is there a way that you can sort of use that role to sort of inspire or create hope or drive any any type of, you know, actual um, positive change in the country? Or The majority of my followers are only Lebanese. I have a huge part of my followers actually from Europe, the US, the Arab world, even Iran. I mean, they're mostly wildlife in people that really don't care about, you know, politics or anything else. So it's a very different type of uh, followers. So it's, it's, it would be a waste for me to use my, my, my uh, social media platform for political. I do once in a while vent my frustration and anger on my, on my uh, social media platform, but it's useless. Because they're, you know, the majority are people that will have no effect on the Lebanese social scene or political scene. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but I guess at the same time you are creating awareness amongst the international community. I am, I am, as much as possible. But yeah, again, I'm not saying this is your job. I'm just having a chat with Michelle no, at the then, end of the day. <laughs> really do it, and whenever there's something like really, really big happening, like the frustration about the pollution of the Karaun uh, Lake yeah, yesterday, yeah. Yeah. this is pathetic. So yes, I talk about this, but again, most people don't really care you know, the international community. They're mostly today, you know, between COVID and and uh, and uh, you know, uh, people in India and Brazil dying because of lack of hospitals. So it's really is we're not we're not their priority. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting if you do do a campaign on all of the trash that we've got going around in the country and how it's actually affecting our wildlife. We can't even find our wildlife under the trash that we're living in. <laughs> but I actually focus on this a bit but uh, again yes this I can do because it's more it's closer to my to the purpose of my page which is you know wildlife conservation nature and all these things so yeah I might do this well I'd love to be a part of your campaign if you want to uh, I mean I've got your back on that one I, Michelle for sure <laughs> now, I, I'm a big I'm a big uh, supporter in that I mean uh, I we hike we surf we snowboard so like all of the sports that we do you know I completely engaged with nature and when you're when you're on the beach and you've literally walk walking through mounds and mounds of mounds of trash just to actually get to the water is uh, it's really, really depressing. And I, I think I'm bringing this up because you made a comment and I was there yesterday and I was seeing it with my eyes yesterday thinking, like, how can we solve this? How can we make such a hoo ha about this that someone's going to have to do something? And the thing is, people that are talking about it right now don't necessarily have any form of influence whatsoever. They're just sort of rambling and ranting and trying to create these cleanups with no sort of support. So I think, you know, um, people like can use you and, and need, need some help, you know, maybe just getting the word out there. It's, it's, it's the same as the, the cleanup of the beaches, you know, after the oil spill. I mean, it was mostly yeah. volunteer uh, uh, cleaning and they did a great job, but, you know, I, I don't think there was any organized government uh, Program and I'm sure nothing's going to happen in in, in Karaun, which is probably far worse than yeah. the beach, because it's the whole water, the whole water is polluted. Yeah, the beach, you know, not I was, I'm not going to say easy. It was hard, but it was feasible. Now I have I'm not a specialist in water, but you know I have no idea how you can clean such a huge body of water. From I, you know, I mean, us is not much better either, where they're electrocuting the fish every five minutes as well. So yeah, we do have a lot of things going on for those that are listening. <laughs> I mean, me and Michelle could probably go on for hours of all of the different things that we have to face here, but I'd rather take this onto a positive note because yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please let's talk about photography, Sophie. <laughs> So, Michelle, what have you got coming up? You know, what have you got in your in your plan? Um, you did tell me that you're leaving Beirut in, I think, maybe a couple of weeks. So what's the next trip about? And where are you going and what you're shooting? <laughs> uh, Kenya on June 10th for about two weeks. And I have a trip planned to Brazil. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this one for about two months, a month and a half, actually, from September 1st to October 15th. Now, these two are the worst 
you know, one, some of the two of the worst COVID destinations, you know, but I'm still, I'm definitely going to Kenya on the 15th of June and Brazil, I'm just playing it by ear. But so Brazil is a tough trip. What are you going to shoot? Is there something specific or are you just going to capture what you can? My, no, basically I focus on cats, on big cats. Mm -hmm. So Kenya is going to be mostly lions, uh, leopards and, and cheetahs. And um, the Brazil, the king, you know, it's, it will be jaguars, which you know I, I, I qualify as being the king of cats. It's, it's an amazing cat. Oh, such uh, a beautiful cat! My favorite and cat. The, the, the thugs, basically, I compare yeah. them. You know, the leopard is elegant, the cheetah is elegant, the leopard is not. The leopard Ibn Sheria, if you really want to. The, sorry, the, the, the jaguar Ibn Sheria. If you really want to <laughs> it's powerful. It's big. It's bulky. It's it's uh, beautiful animals. So, so beautiful. I saw I saw a couple in Sri Lanka when I was there and it was phenomenal. And they were like, you are so lucky that you managed to see the leopard. People come here for hours and hours and hours and never see it. But it just appears. But the, jaguar, the jaguar is basically a bigger version of the leopard. The, the leopard mm. is very elegant. The jaguar is bigger, you know, as I said, the Bencheria. Little exactly, gangster. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a bit bigger than this, but, you know, <laughs> you get the general idea. Uh, so these are my trips, and next year I don't know. Next trip three really depends on. I'm planning on spending more and more trip with time traveling. Actually, I'm planning probably next year I'll being at least four months out of here. I mean, it's going to be. Uh, have you taken your vaccine? Is it like is this all yeah, yeah. easy to go and come? So you no issues it, there on that front. It's not easy, but you know, I pretty much have. I'm vaccinated against pretty much everything from yellow fever <laughs> to uh, to COVID to uh, you know hepatitis A, B. <laughs> All these things and you know i take malaria pills. you're like a walking robocop <laughs> basically i think i glow at night because i have so uh, <laughs> so many vaccines but yes i am vaccinated so um uh, so we see so these are the two trips you know kenya in uh, in uh, june and brazil in September. I, I had another question for you but it's completely gone out of my mind because i was thinking about robocop and vaccinations so <laughs> Was it? I'm, just, I'm just seeing you standing there. I still have this image, you know, and like there's all these different injections. Like, cha, 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 cha. <laughs> Very heavy. Um, so these are the trips. And, you know, I am hopefully, uh, you know, I'll do at least one more this year. By the way, one thing is I will not take photos of animals in captivity. Yeah. So um, to take the photo, even in, even in the reserve, it has, it has to be, the animal has to be in the wild. I've been so happy I had you on my show today. Thanks. I think uh, we've discussed so much. Uh, love your perspective. I think um, Thanks, people Bill. listening uh, can really appreciate what you've had to say. You know, not everyone has been uh, released or... Um, not subject to what's been happening in the country and well, I think it just goes to show. Well, I'm extremely affected by what's happened in the country but I refuse to let it to let this put me down because as I said I'm lucky enough to have my other objective which is wildlife photography. If I was only going to base myself on my business I mean what took me 25 years to build my company is now 10 times smaller so that would be very very depressing if I only had this, but thank God I have my photography. And I have this drive, as I told you, to I really not, I'm not leaving. You know, we're, we need to try to do something out of this country. Well, I always ask my guests um, if they would like to leave any any form of statement or inspiration with their with my audience since they're listening. So I'm going to give you that platform now. If you have anything you want to leave with the audience today, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear it. I, what I will leave with the audience has to do with uh, wildlife and nature and not necessarily Lebanon. We only have one planet. So if we keep on abusing it, whether it's killing animals or slaughtering uh, dolphins or uh, polluting nature, our kids are going to hate us. I don't have kids, so your kids are going to hate you. And uh, because we basically destroyed the only habitat they have. So, thank you, thank you Michelle. I completely agree with you on that. And just on one last note, everybody, we are a crowdfunded organization. You can head to buy me a coffee or through the website levantx.com and every little helps. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. It's thank been you. an absolute pleasure and we can't wait to see the new photos that will be coming out this summer. Take care. Bye.